Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries RPG podcast. I'm joined once again by my lovely wife, Hannah. Hi. And today, after the music, we're going to be talking about our top three monsters for D&D. So for this episode, as we said before the music, we thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about our top three monsters that we use in D&D. And we both come up with our own individual top three that we're going to count down towards our favourite monster in the style of the pop music TV programmes of old. And we're going to back and forth between the two of us. So first of all, love, number three for you. What's your third favourite monster and why? Uh, Is it this cat that's just walked in? No, she's my first favourite uh, animal companion. Okay, um, so number three. Bugbears. Okay, so fairly sort of standard sort of goblinoid, sort of humanoid. Mm-hmm. I like using bugbears rather than goblins or kobolds okay. simply because way back when they were the one that nobody used like ever okay and therefore people didn't really know like the stats for them so when you had those sort of george type players that knew every single number and detail on the page for the orcs in the monster manual yeah i want to throw some sort of similar level similar style villains up against them now from what i understand from the the background like the bugbears are always supposed to be like the slightly more sort of militarily like organized ones you know, the, or, or is that hobgoblins I'm thinking of? To be honest, they're whatever I want them to be oh, when fair. I'm using them. I just like the artwork, if I'm honest. That's absolutely <laughs> fair enough. So what about you, third favourite monster? Okay, my third favourite monster, and there's going to be a couple of undead in my list, is ghosts. And we've talked a little bit about ghosts before on the podcast, but the reason I like them is because, as as a mainly as a GM, they give you an excuse to like shoehorn a bit of background and a bit of like extra plot in, without just doing like a massive plot dump. Because, as tends to be typical, if you have a ghost, they're normally around because something horrible happened to them. They've got unfinished business stuff like that. So it lets you sort of hint at the history of your campaign world without just doing like a massive like box text you know you you can present the sort of background information in a slightly more sort of interesting way it's more like a problem to solve rather than just me reading off a piece of paper and let's face it as gms like we love to like get a bit of our background and a sort of story working in there mm-hmm. and stuff like that so number two for you uh sort of a bit of a sneaky one this not a Scandalous. particular actual monster from the D&D book although there's half a dozen in there that could probably fill the niche but okay. sort of Cronenberg type gribbly Cthulhu sort of, sort of body monsters. horror sort of stuff um, particularly either somebody turning into something gribbly or right. something gribbly disguised as someone a la the thing well, I mean, if effectively, there's a whole series, like you say, of monsters, you know, like doppelgangers, and mm-hmm. obviously there's various gribbly aberrations, like gibbering mouthers and stuff like that, that can sort of fill that sort of Cronenberg-style vibe. But what is it you like about those sort of monsters? It's that whole body horror element of either you don't know whether you can trust someone or not because you don't know whether it's actually them, if it's, like, people turning into things. So it's that sort of paranoia sort of vibe. Or it's the um, element of, like, people have been... something more like the fly, where you've got that sympathetic element of, oh, he was a good man, but now he's been... A monster turned I into a something monster horrible. I become. That sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that's, I mean, this is werewolves and lycanthropes didn't make it into my like top three list, but I do like them as creatures. And I think I'll probably like them for a similar reason you like the big blobby monsters, <laughs> because lycanthropy is a sort of supernatural disease, and you know, you could get infected by it when you're like fighting a werewolf or something like that. So you might be a completely innocent person who ends up with this horrible sort of curse, really. Mm hmm. 
So I think I probably like them for the same reason you like the big sort of blobby Cronenbergs. So what about you? Okay, my number two, and I'm I'm gonna have a bit of a cheat here, so, and uh, we'll, that's fair. I, I think for for number two, I'm gonna go for slimes and molds of all varieties, and. I say of all varieties because there's millions of different mm -hmm. slimes on green slime, yellow mold, russet mold, brown mold, gelatinous cubes, all manner of like slimes and molds. And the reason I like them is because they I tend to see them as like operating in like two very different ways. The first one is you can use them as a trap, as you would do like a pit trap or something like that. Because most slimes and molds, not all of them, but most of them a fairly sort of sedentary they don't sort of roam the dungeons in the way that other denizens do sort of seeking out the player characters to like duff them up they tend to sort of like particularly if they're molds they just sort of lurk around in places and they provide a sort of environmental hazard i suppose you could say so most case scenarios if you wander in a dungeon a mold's not going to suddenly leap out from behind the door and attempt to like duff you up with like a mace or whatever but if you're poking around in like old sort of mold covered bones you could end up breathing in the spores you could end up getting infected with the disease and stuff like that so for me it's a slightly more interesting way and a bit different way of doing a trap mm -hmm. i know technically they're a monster because they're in the monster manual but they work in the same way as a trap you know you come across mm -hmm. them and if you're not careful enough you're a bit sort of headstrong you just rush in consequences will be had you have to make saving throws and stuff like that and i just find that interesting they sort of straddle that gap between like monster and trap the other way i tend to use them is they provide an extra sort of level of i suppose realism in inverted commas or like very similitude whatever you want to call it because let's face it one of the things that uh, would happen in a dungeon let's say you've got a massive dungeon that's the layer of a load of ogres realistically that would be like covered in like poo and all the other waste that these ogres would leave around and yet curiously most dungeons aren't and obviously the, we know the real reason our character is because we don't think about that you know we just want a dungeon we'd, we don't waste all our time describing how the walls are all splattered with like ogre droppings <laughs> and whatever but if you drop something in like a gelatinous cube or maybe like an otiog or something like that i mean the otiog is pretty much designed for it it's this big like crap beast basically mm -hmm. that it specifically says often like forms like a sort of symbiotic relationship with other monsters like surviving by eating their waste so you can use these creatures to provide an in-character justification for why there's not just crap everywhere in the dungeon oh because the gelatinous cube like eats it all it goes along and like cleans it up or oh, the otter yog eats it all so it adds that level of sort of like realism it's, it's tongue-in-cheek realism at best because we mm -hmm. all know the real reason but it's just a nice little extra sort of nod to it and again molds and stuff like that there they tend to come out in the real world as a natural sort of process of decay and stuff like that so having these things about particularly in like old abandoned dungeons where there's dead bodies and stuff like that again it adds this interesting note of sort of realism to the proceedings so drum roll what's your number one so, drakes. What? As in, dragons, but without the intelligence angle. That's like more animalistic. More like animal intelligence. Sort of okay. like the swamp dragons in Terry Pratchett, but the size of a dragon. Okay. With the breath weapons of a dragon. Uh, I like them because when I'm doing a story with a dragon, yeah, I like it to be kind of like a natural disaster action movie kind of a story yeah i entirely agree sweetie i mean i've got a, a huge red dragon called the fire lord in my osc campaign at the minute and that's actually like a human wizard who turned himself into a dragon and but since then i've really like kept him off stage sort mm -hmm. of like political behind the scenes machinations he's more like a force of nature he doesn't keep showing See, up all the time yeah that that's the bit that's there is an intelligence there that has a purpose that could be reasoned with. Yeah. Don't just want to eat you. I oh, want that as well, but no, I know what you mean. He doesn't just want or, that. All a big fire drake wants is to burn everything and eat everything. Yeah. It can't be reasoned with. It can't be persuaded or bribed. You can fight it or you can get out of its way or you can die. They're your options. 
So um, yeah, so in a way, yeah. it, it is really like a natural disaster, like a fire. That's, that well, yeah. yeah, that's why I like them because they are very much that sort of thing Primal. that you've you've got no choice in the matter. There is no way to argue or buy your way out of it. You've got very few options. So, John, yeah, who's going to be your favourite D and D monster? Well, drum roll, please. Well, I played a lot of RPGs in the 90s, so it's vampires, vampires, vampires. So good they named them thrice. Now, all jokes aside about me playing far too much uh, World of Darkness and stuff in the 90s, again, the reason I like vampires is partly for the same reason I like ghosts, and it's also partly for the same reason you said you like sort of Cronenberg-esque creatures. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with vampires, again, they have a past. It's often convoluted, and it's how they ended up being a vampire, so you can get a bit of your world lore in. But also, it's got that whole, like, curse element, like you were talking about with these sort of Cronenberg mm -hmm. shape-changer creatures. Because, although they tend to become evil over time, most vampires didn't start off evil, they sort of got turned into a vampire or something unfortunate happened to them that led to them being in this state. And yet, over thousands of years, they might have embraced it and become evil as all get up. But they often didn't start that way. So you can get a bit of an element of tragedy in there as well. Also, it's a really useful thing because most players, at least on some level, we're all familiar with vampires. Mm. We've all seen a vampire film. We all know about the steaks and the garlic and the running water and all that shizzle. And, yeah, you might say, well, that, that could be like a bit of a detriment because right, surely everyone knows that crosses repel vampires and stuff like that. But that can actually be a really good thing. If you just want a session where you just want to relax and take on an enemy, something you're comfortable with, that character can be good. Or a short session. Yeah, like exactly. Yeah, like a one-shot nice. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Having these like little shortcuts and these things you already know enables you to jump straight into the action. Also, mm -hmm. it allows you to potentially ramp up the tension even more or create sort of confusion and fear, depending on how you play it. Because let's say, for instance, we all know that vampires are repelled by crosses. Let's say in your campaign world... They're not. So what happens the first time your heroes like rock up to a to this vampire and they like do the old cross candlestick tricks in front of it and it just laughs at them because maybe they've not got faith. Maybe only clerics can turn vampires because they can, or maybe you it has to be made out of silver or maybe it has to be a proper cross of a certain religion or whatever. Mm -hmm. Either way. The, that'll then put the player. If you want to do it like that, that'll then put the players on the back foot. Probably make them a little bit more wary, but also it rewards those players who do that little bit of background research and that bit of legwork to find out how vampires work in your campaign world. Mm -hmm. Very much. It's one of those things that you can really customize to yeah. your game world. And I know they did like the Forgotten Realms vampires where they had like the elf vampires that were affected by gold instead of silver and the, um, I can't remember what, it was it Iron for Dwarves? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, I kind of vaguely remember it. I remember that the halflings were repelled by tobacco smoke that's instead right. of garlic. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, no, that's right, I'd forgot all about that, I like that. There, there's so many different ways that you can take the thousands of vampire myths that exist and customise them to your own game world. Yeah, I was going to say, absolutely right, and you've hit on a very good point there as well, which is another reason I love them. The fact is, there are so many vampire myths in the real world, like the Pengallon and stuff like that, that... Even if there's not a version of that vampire already in D&D, which, let's face it, there probably is in one of the very many and various monster mm -hmm. manuals over the years, even if there's not an exact replica, you can probably take the normal vampire, switch a few of its weaknesses and strengths around, and get a representation of the vampire you want. So maybe you want them to be a bit, a bit more like the, uh, the original sort of Eastern European vampires with a bit more bestial, a bit more ghoul-like. You take a few bits from the ghoul... You swap them out for the bits of the vampire, happy mm -hmm. days, you're done. You don't have to worry about it. But the fact is, you can make a unique, in inverted commas, vampire with very little work. I mean, we've all got Google now. You get on Google, type in like vampire myths, you'll get hundreds of them, all of which you can very easily draw on inspiration and you can 
tweak the existing vampire stats with very little effort whatsoever. There's been numerous books from like the Van Richten's Guide and stuff like that in D&D and various other RPG systems that talk about different types of vampires. So effectively you've got like, the ultimate amount of resources at your command to very easily tailor something specific for your campaign world, which will give you a lot of sort of reward for comparatively little work. And for my money, you can't really go far wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And also I fucking love the world of darkness, so. <laughs> so there we are. Do you have anything else you want to say about uh, any of your top monsters or any of my top monsters? Okay, Hannah's shaking her head. So we've reached the end of this episode. We hope you've enjoyed our slightly rambling tour through our top three monsters each. And I've got to admit, I don't know about you, love, but mine sort of fluctuate on a probably a daily basis. I'd say I'm fairly consistent in my use of those three. Now, if you wanted me to look for a top five, I'd really struggle to pick two more. Yeah, that's <laughs> fair. But we hope you've enjoyed the episode anyway. If you'd like to call in, maybe tell us what your own top three monsters are or what you think of our top three. Do you love the vampire? Do you hate the doppelganger or vice versa? Do you love a bit of slime and mould in your games? Either way, call in and tell us. You can get in touch in a few different ways. You can leave us a voicemail message on SpeakPipe or Anchor. Or you could send us an email to rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. We might feature your call in in a future episode. So until we see you again, take care, stay safe, and whatever you're playing, have fun. Bye.